All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and go through blood histology uh, via video this week. So uh, if you don't already, go ahead and grab your packet of pain because I'm going to be looking at the packet uh, as I go through this and kind of checking some certain things off. Uh, so if you don't have that out already, go ahead and grab that. Pause the video. Go ahead and grab that and get that in front of you. That way we're literally on the same page. All right, so let's go ahead and make this full screen. All right, so blood histology this week. Uh, blood's a really important thing because you're going to be dealing with it no matter what career field you go into. Uh, you're going to be either reading your own uh, reports about your blood and, and certain levels of different things in your blood. Um, and that can just be a window into your body to see what the heck is going on. And so this week, mostly what we're doing is blood histology. And so with histology, you know, with your naked eye, you can't, you, we've all seen blood. It's just a, a red liquid. It's nothing, nothing more or less than that. Uh, but you got to break out the microscope and take a look at the individual cells. So blood overall, I'll stay on this picture just to get a look at what, what you're generally going to be looking at under the microscope is something like this. This is zoomed in as much as possible. We're probably going to be at a thousand times magnification. Um, so a little bit more zoomed out than this picture. But really, blood is quite simple compared to the other tissues that we look at. It's basically about 45% red blood cells here, which are these cells that we're all familiar with already, but what's special about them is that they're really, really simple cells. They're shaped in a disc, which you can kind of see here. It's called a biconcave disc, which is kind of like a, uh, kind of like a donut shape. Uh, it doesn't actually have a hole in the middle, but it's kind of, if you were to drip water on top of a red blood cell, it would all collect towards the center because it's lower in the center than it is on its sides. And that's mostly to increase surface area so that these cells can exchange with things very, very efficiently. So they have a very small volume. And the cell themselves, if you look, you can't see anything inside of them. There's really almost nothing but hemoglobin. And so there's an enzyme and, and mostly hemoglobin in there. And so you can think of red blood cells as simply sacs of hemoglobin uh, floating around in the vessels of your body. And the reason you need blood overall is because you need to be able to carry gases. And obviously, we all know a lot about oxygen, but CO2 is also extremely important, um, as well as nitric oxide and other gases that we need to carry in the blood. The problem with certain gases is that they don't dissolve very well. And if you remember back to Biology 112 and the difference between uh, polar molecules and nonpolar molecules, the, the, ones, the molecules that are polar, meaning one end of the molecule has a positive charge and one end has a negative charge, those will dissolve in water because water is also polar. It also has a positive and negative charge on it. And so carbon dioxide dissolves really, really well in water. That's why we use it in drinks. Uh, that's why we carbonate with it. Uh, it'll it'll go into a fluid very easily because it's a polar molecule. Oxygen and other nonpolar molecules that exist as gases are really difficult to get to dissolve in water, but we have to rely on them. And so we have to build uh, proteins like hemoglobin and store hemoglobin in these little cells called red blood cells, or the fancy name is erythrocyte. Uh, we have to store them in there so that when our blood passes through our lungs, it doesn't uh, just get rid of CO2 or exchange CO2. It also can grab some of these molecules that don't dissolve very well like oxygen primarily. Oxygen doesn't dissolves maybe 1 20th as well as CO2. And so this is why primarily hemoglobin is for carrying oxygen and extracting it from the atmosphere and taking it to our tissues. The other cells, which represent less than 1% of our blood, are white blood cells, or leukocytes. Leuco meaning white. And so that's what you see over here and here, and platelets, these little purple specks, these are considered white blood cells as well. And so these are our immune system cells. There are many different ones. And these are what we're really going to be spending most of the time this week looking at under the microscope. Because you guys all can pick out a erythrocyte already. What you're going to spend your time looking at really this week is picking out five general types of leukocytes. And you're going to be just learning the distinguishing feature of each one of those cells and being able to confidently identify them. All right, so now we're going to move into the actual material here. Um, if you take a look at your packet, it has a really extensive long first page because it's talking about oil immersion, warning you about making sure you're responsible with oil immersion, which we'll talk about in lab. Uh, also, actually, yeah, most of it's oil immersion. If you flip over to the second page, there's a lot of activities today or for this week. And we're most of them, if you look under number six, 
There's A, B, A through F, um, hemat hematocrit, hemoglobin, clotting time, differential white blood cell count, and ABO, RH blood typing. In a normal week, we would only do hemoglobin determination and ABO blood typing. And I don't think we're going to be doing the hemoglobin determination. You're going to need to know it conceptually, but we're not actually going to be doing it in lab. And we may not even have time for the ABO blood typing. This is where you prick your finger and then you take your blood and you expose it to antibodies and then you figure out what your blood type is. Uh, we'll be doing blood typing conceptually for sure, uh, but we may not actually be doing that in lab. And so don't worry about hemoglobin determination and I'll tell you guys in lab or you'll know whether or not we actually do uh, the blood typing for E right there, the ABO blood typing. All right, and then moving down, we have a couple procedures here. But really what we're going to get into is the composition of blood. So let's just talk about what blood is. Because to most people, they think of it all as the same, kind of just this big red fluid. But if you actually look at blood on the left-hand side here, this is what we're used to seeing. But if you take blood and you spin it in a centrifuge, you can actually separate the different components of blood. So this whole, file, this whole vial is filled actually mostly with plasma. And plasma is about 55% of your total blood. And plasma is mostly water and 90% 90, 90 of it's water, uh, but there's also some important proteins floating around in there, and this is where all your sodium and potassium and all those ions that dissolve in water, they need, they're all in the plasma. Then you have this really small fragment here called this Buffy coat. It's kind of a funny name, but really it's just white. Um, it almost, oh man, it's almost like plaque or something like that. That's what it looks like, and it sits right on top of the red whole blood cells right here, or your erythrocytes. And so these are the three major components of blood, the plasma, the buffy coat, and the erythrocytes. Uh, erythrocytes are normally right around an average of 45%. Men can get uh, up around 52 to 53%, um, but the percentages are listed in your packet. I believe they're on the, yeah, the page 22, so the next page. Um, you have the normal female values at 42, plus or minus 5%, and the normal male values at 47, plus or minus 7%. And so these vary depending on if you're bleeding, if you're a highly trained athlete, um, or any number of reasons, but right around 45%. And so that's pretty much it for the makeup of blood. Like I said, erythrocytes are kind of boring uh, at the histological level, so where we're going to focus is on this buffy coat. And this buffy coat is white because it's actually made of the white blood cells uh, or the leukocytes. So this is just talking about the composition of blood plasma. You'll talk about this a lot more in lecture, but here are all these ions um, and other really important proteins, albumin, fibrinogen, and globulin proteins. These are all found in the blood plasma. All right, so here we go. Here's our total formed elements again. And so formed elements are all of the things that your body actually makes. So it's everything but the plasma. So we already talked about 45% being erythrocytes. The little, little buffy coat is actually made of some a little bit of platelets um, and the leukocytes. So if we take a look specifically at this, these leukocytes, which make up less than 1% of your total blood volume, it's made up of all of these things. So you've got granulocytes and agranulocytes and five neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. Those are your five main white blood cells. In parentheses here is the percentage of the population of white blood cells that each individual type makes up. So of all of your white blood cells, neutrophils make up 50 to 70%. They're the most common. All the way down to basophils here, these are your least common, about 0.5 to 1% of your total white blood cells. So they're not the percentage of your blood. That should be kind of obvious if you think about it. It's You don't have 50% neutrophils in your blood. This is the percentage of all of the WBCs, the white blood cells. And so these are the normal values. So if you're outside of these ranges, if you have too many basophils or something like that, then you might have something going on in your body that requires a lot of basophils. And so we'll talk about basophils later and you'll see exactly what that means. All right, so this is straight from your lab manual. Uh, I like this chart because it organizes all of the white blood cells. It's two pages. This is table 17.2. Uh, it may have a different chapter in the newer book, but you'll find it. It's in the blood chapter and this is the main chart that represents all of our information. So we already talked about lymphocytes. Um, the second page has two more white blood cells. So lymphocytes, monocytes, 
neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophils. And so these have, there's a lot of information here. There's the name, obviously, but there's also the relative number. And so this is how many cells uh, per microliter that are found. And so I, it's kind of silly the, the way that they do it. They actually count them up. But know them in terms of percentages. It's a much more intuitive way to represent the same thing. So these are the percentages, not the actual counts of how many of each white blood cell exists. These are just them counting them all up. But the percentages are a much more useful way to think about it uh, because the, the total count may vary, but the percentage can be the same. And so I emphasize, take a look at these percentages, which you'll see on the next slides as well. So think of these in percentages, not in total numbers. All right, so overall, I would, if you have your book out, I would flip to this page. The other thing I like about this chart is these sizes are actually accurate uh, relative to each other. You know, the white blood cells are not actually like as big as a quarter, but the monocyte is actually about this much bigger than a lymphocyte. So take that into account. These sizes are real uh, relative to each other.